Hello again, and welcome to the second video in your three-part visual effects and graphics training series. In the first video, we looked a bit at visual effects, specifically how to perfectly stabilize a shot using After Effects, and then a bit about keying out parts of the footage from the background. Now, it's time to look at the graphics side of things. Your boring still images could be turned into engaging 3D visualizations. Your maps could go from basic satellite photos to immersive 3D shots. And screenshots of websites could come to life and add some excitement to an edit instead of sucking the life out of it. Heck, even interfaces and tutorials <clears throat> can be made way cooler and help set your work apart from the average edit. The possibilities are pretty much endless. Let's look at an example in a bit more detail. We've all needed to use still images like photos or illustrations in our edits, but they tend to be a bit boring and, well, static. To spice things up, you might add a slow resize effect in your editing software to simulate a bit of camera zoom. That's a little more interesting. Or you could add a couple position keyframes to simulate a pan. Not bad either, but we can do a lot better. Let's see how we can use After Effects to give this image some depth, some atmosphere, a bit of movement, and then bring the whole thing to life. Here we go. We've got a new comp here at 1920 by 1080 at 2398 frames per second and a duration of six seconds. We'll go ahead and drag in our source image and resize it to fit the comp. This is gonna be our reference as we set up the 3D planes for the environment. So we'll create a new white solid and call it ground plane. And we'll add an effect called grid that'll make it easier for us to line it up with the image. The default settings are fine. We'll make the layer 3D with this little button here, rotate it 90 degrees and move it down until it lines up with the water. Then we'll rotate it a bit more to match the angle of the photo and we'll move it back to line up with the shoreline. I'm gonna use the reposition anchor point tool a cheap and incredibly useful plugin to quickly place the anchor point at the back edge of the plane so I can easily scale it left, right, forward, and back to completely cover the ground of the image. Perfect. Now, I'll just duplicate the ground plane with Command or Control D, rename it to Riverbank Plane, and rotate it around that new anchor point at the back to come straight up from the ground. We can scale it down a bit just so it covers the riverbank because we want that to be separate from the background to help create that feeling of parallax and depth. And speaking of the background, we'll just duplicate the riverbank now, name it background plane, and move it a little bit back in Z space and then scale it vertically to fully cover the image from top to bottom. So if we turn off the background image and the transparency grid and rotate around the comp a little bit, we can see what we've made. A flat surface for the water, a flat surface for the riverbank coming up from the far side of the river, and then a big flat surface in the back for everything in the distance, like the sky and the trees. Okay, so that's a lot already. For those of you guys new to After Effects, you might feel overwhelmed, that's all right. This lesson is designed to show you what's possible, and we've got a lot more training that's gonna fill in any gaps. All right, let's keep going, because now comes the magic. We're gonna project the image across all these surfaces to simulate the 3D environment. Here is a very rough sketch I did to show you what I mean. It'll be as if we're shining a light through a pane of stained glass, AKA the image, onto 3D geometry that's gonna give it depth. If that's confusing, you'll get what I mean soon. Oh, and by the way, just for fun, here's what ChatGPT came up with for the sketch for this tutorial. Pretty cool, just not 100% accurate to the concept, so I went with mine instead. So we need a few things to do this. First, we'll make a new camera. Note that it's a two-node camera, meaning that we'll be able to control its position and what it's looking at independently. And we're using the 50 millimeter focal length preset. Next, we'll make a new 3D light. It's a point light with 100% intensity, fall off set to none, cast shadows turned on, shadow darkness set to 100%, and shadow diffusion set to zero. Now we want the light to be in the same general part of the world as the camera so that it illuminates the scene from the same side. We'll just place it exactly where the camera is by copying the position attributes of the camera, Command or Control C, and pasting them onto the position attributes of the light, Command or Control V. I'm just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping and color code my layers and label my camera. Now for our projection plane, i.e. the stained glass window. So let's duplicate the reference image and turn off the original and make the new one 3D. 
will parent the projection plane to the camera and then set all the position coordinates to zero, which is another way of placing two objects in the exact same place. This time, we actually want the projection plane to be just a tiny bit in front of the light and the camera's location so that the light can shine through it. We'll just move the projection plane forward in Z space by like three pixels. There we go. Okay, so the plane is way too big. We'll just scale it down a lot to cover the image. Now, we just need to adjust the material settings on the projection plane to behave like stained glass. In After Effects, it's the shadow that's going to carry the color through the plane. So we're going to set cast shadows to only. That means that the plane disappears and we only see the shadow that it casts. Then we'll set light transmission to 100% so that all of the light travels through it, picking up the colors of our image. Immediately, you can see it shining onto the grid pattern of our ground, riverbank, and background planes. Accepts shadows and accepts lights can be turned off because we don't need to see shadows or lights on the projection plane itself. So that's it for the stained glass projection plane. Now, we'll just make a couple adjustments to the surfaces in our 3D world so that it all looks right. First, we'll remove that grid effect from the ground, riverbank, and background layers. We don't need it anymore. I'm just selecting each layer and then deleting the effect from the effects control panel. And then in the material options on all three, We'll turn off accepts lights because we want them to have their look completely controlled by the multicolored shadows coming through that stained glass projection plane. It's looking cool. We've got good depth going on, but there's still some more work to do. For starters, everything looks a bit blurry, but that's an easy fix. Because the colors of the image are coming from our shadows of our projection plane, we need to increase the resolution of the shadow map. We'll go to Composition Settings, 3D Renderer, Options, and change the shadow map resolution from comp size all the way up to 4000. Much better and much sharper now. Now, let's mask out the riverbank so that we only see the dirt and not the trees since they're already on the background plane. We'll just click on our riverbank layer, switch to a front view, grab the pen tool, and then draw a mask all the way around it. I'm going to speed things up a bit. And there we go. I'm just going to add a little 5 pixel mask feather to smooth things out a little bit. And now we've got our riverbank on its own layer. So let's turn all the other layers back on and have a look. You might notice a little remnant of the boat on the riverbank, but don't worry, that's going to get cleaned up later. We're going to want to animate that boat moving down the river. So we should remove it from the ground layer so that we've got a blank river for it to float on. The ground, like everything else, gets its colors and textures from the projection plane. So that's where we're going to work. We're going to make a pre-comp out of the layer by selecting it and hitting Command-Shift-C on a Mac or Control-Shift-C on a PC. Then inside the pre-comp, duplicate the image, find a spot on the shoreline that looks like it could replace the boat, draw a quick mask, drag the patch layer over the boat, and then feather it a bunch so it's seamless. And now, back in our main comp, we've got a wide open river ready for travel. So we've got our full 3D environment in good shape, but now we need a little layer with just the boat people so we can animate them separately. So again, we'll just duplicate our original image. I'm gonna pre-compose it, but you don't really need to, and we'll name it boat people. In the new pre-comp, we'll just zoom in with the mouse scroll wheel, grab our pen tool, and then draw some masks around the boat and the people. You'll notice that I'm drawing multiple masks based on the shapes that I'm masking. In this case, you could probably just make one big mask here around everything, but it's generally good practice when masking and rotoscoping to mask individual shapes out separately so that you can more easily control the parts of the mask later on. But that's a conversation for another day. You can see that I've left a bit of room around the objects that I'm masking, and then I feathered the mask, about five pixels. Because they'll be against a tan river, you don't really need to worry too much about cutting them out perfectly. So you can see here that our pre-comp is huge. It's the size of the original image, not just the part that we masked out. We don't need all that extra space, so we're just going to use the region of interest tool to draw a box around our boat people and then crop the comp to the region of interest. Great. Now we'll use our handy reposition anchor point tool again to line it up at the bottom of the boat layer, parent the boat to the ground layer, and zero out the Y coordinates to move the boat down to ground height. Scale it up a little bit, and then slide it into place on the river. And just like all the other 3D layers in our world, we're going to turn off accepts lights. 
So wouldn't it be cool if we had a bit of a reflection from the boat in the water as it moved? I think so, and it's pretty easy to do. We'll just duplicate the boat people layer, and then we're going to rotate it so that the reflections are upside down. Well, they just disappeared. That's because they're literally going below the ground plane. You can see here by this dotted box that goes around all the 3D layer widgets, it means that they're all in the same 3D group, and wherever they are in 3D space is going to determine their visibility. Makes sense, and that's how the real world works, but it's a problem for us, so we're going to adjust it. By placing a 2D layer, like an adjustment layer, in between the reflection layer and the other 3D objects, you can see that we now have two different 3D groups, with the reflections on a layer above all the other 3D stuff. Now, they won't be hidden by the ground plane anymore. It's a bit of a hack, and it's also an advanced concept, so we'll dig into that more in another lesson. So let's drop the opacity of the reflections layer down to like 25%, parent them to the boat layer so that they move together, and for a little extra touch, we'll go into the reflections pre-comp, add the wave warp effect, and play around with the settings until we've got some horizontal ripples to simulate the reflections in the water around the boat. Oops. All right, so it looks like the reflections are on both the boat layer and the reflections layer. That's because we use the same pre-comp for each, so what you do to one gets done to the other. Again though, it's another easy fix. We'll just duplicate the pre-comp in the project window, name it something different, and then with our reflection layer selected in the comp, just alter option drag it on top to replace the old reflections pre-comp with the new one. Then we'll just go into the actual boat people layer and remove the wave warp effect since it doesn't need to be there. Perfect. So this graphic is in good shape now, and we could call it done, but we're gonna add a couple finishing touches because we're not lazy and we care. We've got a piece of black and white stock footage of some billowing smoke that I think would look cool in our environment, kind of like fog and humidity rolling out of the jungle and over the water. Let's just drag the smoke footage into our comp, make it 3D, and position it between our camera and the content in the little 3D world that we've made. You can slide the fog footage layer left and right in your comp to find a section of the smoke movement that you think will look good. Now, we'll just set the fog layer blending mode to screen so that we only see the light parts, aka the fog itself. And then we'll just add a little bit of brightness and contrast effect to the layer to give it a little bit more punch. And it looks pretty good. This whole process is the same technique that you would use to add dust, light rays, even fake rain. So that's it. We've created our world. So let's just animate the camera and the boat to see what everything looks like. We'll make a new knoll that's going to be the focal point of our camera because we want some depth of field going on as the camera moves around. We'll parent the focus knoll to the boat and then use our trick of zeroing out the position coordinates to place it at the same location as the boat. We'll open up our camera settings. We'll turn on depth of field. And then let's crank up the aperture and the blur levels to make it shallower and more dramatic. And by the way, a good trick for nice depth of field is to use the triangle setting, which renders pretty fast. Then you set the iris roundness to 100%, which keeps the out of focus sections nice and smooth, i.e. not looking like little triangles. Now, to make sure the boat is what's in focus, we can select both the focus knoll and the camera, right click on either one, and then choose camera, and then link focus distance to layer. Boom. Now our boat's in perfect focus. And since the focus null is parented to the boat, it'll automatically adjust the camera to keep the boat in focus no matter where it goes in our 3D world. So we'll just go ahead and make some position keyframes to animate the boat moving down the river. And we'll set some keyframes for the camera's point of interest and position. One set of keyframes at the beginning of the timeline and another at the end. And then using the one, two, and three keys on our keyboard, We'll just rotate, move, and zoom the camera to start and stop where we like it, and then we'll hit play. And there we have it. We've created a pretty darn cool 3D animation from an otherwise boring still image. Graphics like this are going to go a long way in making an edit much more interesting and engaging to watch. And of course, you can use techniques like this across countless types of images and scenarios. You're basically only limited by your imagination and a little bit of knowledge, but that's what we're here for. So it's obvious that motion graphics are cool and they'll make your edits look a lot more professional and interesting to watch. But that does beg the question, do I, or you, the editor, 
actually need to be the ones to make them. Not necessarily. For some types of graphics, you could go to a website and download a template. There are a lot of sites out there like these, and I've used them myself. If you can find one that works for your specific use case, moves how you need it to, allows you to show the exact things that you need to show, and then fits the look that you're going for, that absolutely works. However, and I think you can see where I'm going with this, there's issues. So what if you take on a paid job thinking that you'll use a template for any graphics that you need, but then you can't find one that works? Or what if you need to substantially modify a template to get it to work and to show what you need to show, but you don't know how? What if you do know how, but the template's a disorganized mess and it's impossible to work with? But if the stars align and you dodge those issues, what if finding a good template takes 30 minutes of searching and then an hour of setup and experimentation to get it to sort of kind of work? At that point, you probably could have made your own graphic that looks and works perfectly from the beginning. And what about the next graphic you need? And the next one? And the one after that? Or what if the client has notes? Even if you do find five templates that work for the various graphics in your cut, it's probably gonna look like a disjointed mess made by five different people, because it is. All right, so there's pros and cons to pre-made templates. So what about having somebody else make them for you? That's an option too. You could hire a dedicated motion designer from someplace like Fiverr or Upwork. You might get lucky, find someone great right away, and they can be your cheap new graphics person. That's totally possible, though it's never been my experience. First, nothing is $5. Just like if you've ever been to the dollar store, almost nothing is $1. The better freelancers have rates far higher than that. And then there's add-ons and extras that aren't really optional. So you end up paying about $50 to $200 by the time you're done. Second, you've got to wait in line. Sometimes they can tackle your project right away, but the better people are going to be busier so you won't be first on their list. So at this point, you've paid $100 and waited three days to get back something that you're sort of happy with. And like with the templates, this is just one graphic. It often gets to the point where you end up thinking, I could have just done this myself. Which brings up one final question. Do you need to be an artist to make this type of stuff? What if you're more left brain than right? More of a technician than a Picasso? Don't worry about it. A lot of those decisions can be simplified and there's some pretty easy visual guidelines that you can follow to make your graphics look good. In a couple days, we'll be sending out your third video with tips and techniques for simplifying some of the artistic parts involved in using visual effects and graphics in your edits. We'll also be touching on some of the financial benefits of adding these types of skills to your toolkit and then looking at a sneak peek of our full course, The Art of Visual Effects and Graphics for Editors.